Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Join host Sanjay Puri as he explores the dynamic and developing world of artificial intelligence governance. Each episode features deep dives with global leaders at the forefront of regulating AI responsibly, tackling the challenges using AI can bring about head on and enabling balance without hindering innovation. Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Artificial intelligence, AI, stands at the forefront of technological evolution, with experts predicting that it could add trillions of dollars to our GDP. But it could also negatively impact our workforce and national security. So how do we regulate it without stifling innovation? Our podcast features insights from various perspectives, from industry leaders and CEOs to government officials to advocacy groups and civil rights groups. Together, they address pivotal questions that are needed to create practical legislation. I'm very excited to have Carmel Shakar with us today. Carmel is the faculty director of the Health, Law and Policy Clinic and assistant clinical professor of law, Harvard Law School, Center for Health, Law and Policy Innovation. I invited her on this show as it is very important to get many different perspectives towards framing AI legislation and we need to get the perspective of health policy leaders. Welcome, Carmel. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Regulating AI podcast. Thank you for having me. So, Carmel, uh, our listeners uh, are uh, all over the world. They're uh, members of Congress, they're staff, think tanks, industry, advocacy groups, as I said. Can you provide them just a brief overview of your work in health law and policy? And how does it intersect with uh, technologies like AI? Sure. So I am a health law scholar by training. I've always been interested in what happens when there's innovation in healthcare. And innovation could mean building a different healthcare finance and delivery model. But increasingly, I think it means the use of novel digital products in healthcare. So several years ago, when I was executive director of the Petrie Plum Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School, we launched a project on precision medicine and artificial intelligence, looking at, all right, how does the medical system incorporate AI? How should it do so ethically? And what should the regulatory frameworks look like? So, uh, Carmel, just as a follow-up, and this is more for my curiosity than or maybe for our audience curiosity. Uh, you talked about precision medicine. And one of the things that a lot of our listeners who come in, they talk about personalized education, that you know your skills are different than mine. I should be taught differently than you do. Same thing applies, uh, you know, uh, different people have different bodies, compositions. The medicines generally, you know, it's not shouldn't be a one size fits all. Do you think with, through AI precision medicine is very possible? You know, that's an interesting question. At the time that we were building that project, it felt like precision medicine and AI were very intertwined and neck and neck. And then by the time that project launched in 2016, 2017, it was clear that all of the focus was on AI. I do think that AI can help drive forward precision medicine and personalized medicine in ways that can be really helpful if properly implemented. But I do think there's a growing awareness that AI in medicine goes beyond precision medicine and has many more applications. Oh, well, yeah. In fact, as I said, we have a lot of guests who have come in, members of Congress and others who have said if there's one area that AI, you're going to see the maximum benefits is in healthcare. So talking about that, let's just talk about how do you see uh, AI impacting the healthcare industry in terms of Regulation and policy. We obviously will talk a little bit about the other benefits, but in terms of regulation and policy, how do you see it impacting uh, uh, it? So 
So I will say that often when I tell people that I work on the ethics of digital health technologies, they assume that I'm really negative on the idea of incorporating these technologies, that I'm like, no, it really should just be your physician with a pad of paper writing prescriptions that nobody can read. And it's really the opposite. So for me, I think our health system really needs to grow and evolve. There are a lot of people who need health care, a lot of people who don't get a chance to access the health care they need. Treatments are becoming only more expensive. And at the same time, our workforce is significantly burned out. So we're facing a major health care workforce shortage. I think AI is an amazing tool for extending the resources we have to better cover people and give them the health care they need. So the example I always give, I have a four-year-old and two-year-old. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of illnesses going around my house and we make a lot of doctor visits. I don't necessarily need a person to be the one writing the antibiotic drops prescription when my daughter has pink eye. And I think it's probably a better medical system if we can leverage AI to handle my daughter's pink eye that is relatively straightforward and reserve our precious healthcare workforce person hours for cases that really need that human touch. So, uh, because this is a very fascinating area, because when we look at the inequities in healthcare, whether it is in rural versus urban, whether it's in our cities or across the board, do you think AI has the potential to reduce a lot of those inequities? I mean, you kind of touched on it, that those resources could be better applied where, because we have limited resources and, you know, mental health is one great example of that. So what are your thoughts? You are the expert. So we're going to try to get as much as I can because this is a very fascinating area. Yeah, I do think that AI can be a really useful extender of the resources we have. And the better we extend our resources, the better they reach underserved populations. So that might be really partnering AI with telehealth modalities, especially in rural communities where getting the person actually in the room with the physician is really difficult. It might mean hospitals being able to handle more patients at a time. I know that there's a lot of work being done in kind of healthcare management and healthcare operations to see how AI can help their organizations, which are really complex, move forward and gain capacity. I think the challenge there is like well-implemented AI is the best possible outcome and poorly implemented AI can, I think, just recreate the problems and the biases in our system or even make them worse. So to pick up on that point of uh, badly done AI or biases, et cetera, what are some of the most pressing ethical issues surrounding the use of AI in healthcare? And do you think legislation can address some of these concerns? Yes. So the flaws and challenges of AI, I think- In, the he in healthcare. In healthcare, of course, not talking about self-driving cars. Yes. Um, I think first the challenge is just because we can build it, should we build it? So I remember talking to some researchers who were trying to use AI to identify which patients in the ICU were at most risk of dying within, I think it was the next 24 hours. And they were able to create an algorithm that did it, but because it was black box, they had no idea why. So it's almost like something out of science fiction, right? Like 
the algorithm tells you that your grandma is going to die in 24 hours, but nobody knows why. So there's nothing that can be done to head it off. I think that goes to the, okay, what are we building? Why are we building it? Is it useful? In that case, that team said, look, it really like puts a lot of stress on patients, on their families, and on the provider team. And so it's ultimately not useful. It's a net negative. I think then there's the very classic, which I'm sure a lot of guests before myself have talked about, the problem of garbage in, garbage out. So it's not like AI, at least to date, is not a moral actor. It's not like AI itself can be sexist or racist or homophobic. But if you give it data that incorporates those social flaws, the con Conclusions that it will put out will have those flaws. And some of it is within the training data itself. The classic example, of course, is Yad Obermeyer's work looking at a healthcare resource algorithm that incorporated data that really showed that patients of color had to be sicker before they got resources. The other example I would flag is a radiology algorithm that was reading scans for breast cancer that was created in the UK, which has a very different ethnic makeup than large parts of the US. So they built this algorithm in the UK, it worked there, and then they brought it to the US where it did extraordinarily poorly reading scans of women of color. I think it was maybe even like a little worse than flipping a coin. And so both of those are, one of those, the bias is in the training set. And one of those, the bias is in who wasn't in the training set. But both kind of create the situation where the recommendations the AI give doesn't really work. So it's basically the data and the training of the data uh, is one of the big issues that you're talking about, right, uh, Armel? Okay. Um, so when you look at healthcare and you compare it with some other industries, uh, do you see any specific or unique challenges in uh, in the regulation of AI? Yes, I do. I think. We, healthcare is a really big industry, but healthcare is also, in a lot of ways, it's social service. Healthcare is where we go when we are most fragile, when we're most vulnerable. And, you know, by the sheer fact that none of us live forever, healthcare is where a lot of us go, where the outcome doesn't necessarily end up positive. And so I think because people have that heightened vulnerability, there's a real pressure to get things right. Then I will say on the regulatory side, we have a system that has evolved that is really interesting in that, you know, we have the FDA, which regulates pharmaceuticals and medical devices as they come to market. And it does some post-market approval and oversight, but it's really, can this thing be sold? And then we have health and human services and CMS, which really look at the structure of healthcare, of healthcare financing and delivering. So they're regulating that portion of the healthcare system. And then we have the states, which traditionally have had the police power that's catch-all that allows them to regulate the practice of medicine. And so because you have all of these different regulators they may all be touching pieces of the AI elephant, but I'm not sure that any one regulator has the entire elephant. So any regulator has the entire elephant. That brings me to another question because you raise a very interesting point. Do you think AI regulation should be specific to industries or it should be just across uh, horizontal as you know, let's say the uh, EU AI Act in many cases is across a uh, horizontal. Or you think, given what you've described to me, is 
a lot of unique things. You know, you said we have FDA, we have CMS, we have, you know, uh, other HHS, you know, you could have other agencies relating to uh, some of these things, NIH and others. Uh, you think that there should be a sp industry specific legislation or regulation for AI? Yeah, so I think the challenge is that AI as a medical device is unique. It's new. It's a different in kind, not in quantity, because it's really the first device that can do medical decision making for us. And now we don't technically let it do its own decision making. There's always supposed to be a, a licensed professional who at the end of the day, the responsibility ends with them to make that medical decision. But that's because we're not yet comfortable with AI being a standalone decision maker. It could do that. We could program AI to make that decision. And I think that's where kind of this divided regulatory landscape really struggles because, you know, it's a product, it's a medical device, so it should go to the FDA. But it's also the practice of medicine. So should it be the state medical boards that also regulate it? It affects healthcare delivery and financing. Think about all of those algorithms that really go to healthcare management and healthcare operations. So should it be something like CMS looking at it? I think it's going to take a lot of coordination from across the regulatory spectrum to truly have oversight of medical AI. Uh, another question, which in Washington, uh, there's a debate that we should have a, a separate, unique body that regulates AI. And obviously, there is a lot of push and pull that it should not be. What are your thoughts? Do we need uh, a, a separate organization that, you know, like you have for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or something like that? I mean, I think that part of the problem is there's maybe already too many cooks in the kitchen. So I'm not sure that the regulatory model we should pursue is adding another cook. I think maybe it should be what's better, how do we get the cooks to talk to each other, read the same recipe, or to put it another way, in healthcare operations and management, there's always a sense that kind of the grade, the time of greatest danger to the patients in the hospital is during those handoff periods where people go off shift and come on shift. There's a lot of work to done to, that happens with rounds, trying to communicate knowledge about each patient. But there's a reason that medical shifts are long to try to minimize that handover. And I think the same is true with regulations. The more agencies you have, the more handoffs you have, the more a chance that something is missed or, oh, we would do something, but it's not within our scope, so we can't do anything. And so I think thinking about how do you best minimize regulatory handoffs between the different agencies and get them coordinated so that it's maybe interagency teams as opposed to creating a new agency that, you know, people might feel territorial, like, oh, this used to be our thing to regulate, but now, like, this new agency came along. I think, like, again, just getting the cooks to talk to each other might be a better way to go about things. Cooks to talk to each other. I'm in Washington. Cooks are not talking to each other. I, it's, it's not happening, Carmel. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's wishful thinking, but you made a, a very important point of biggest vulnerability is when there is a handoff, and uh, that's something for our listeners to keep in mind from a health expert that that's when the biggest vulnerability is um, interagency cooperation. But you know, a lot of the feedback we're getting from members of Congress is firstly, it's Creating another agency in this environment is not going to be possible. And what the, the members of Congress say, we don't need another bureaucracy uh, because it'll just be uh, another heart. But your feedback is uh, very, very helpful. Um, 
Carmel, uh, when, you know, there are going to be AI-driven uh, healthcare innovations, some of them you already talked about in your prior job, et cetera. How can policymakers make sure that a lot, some of these innovations, whether it's in pharmaceutical, medical devices, uh, you name it in care, preventive care, are accessible and equitable for all populations, as you have talked about that health equity does not exist, whether it's in our training data or the training data is a reflection of real life in many ways. Yeah, so I think that it's a challenge to make sure that the AI being developed is equally useful for all patients, or at least not harmful for certain patients. And I think there's an awareness, a growing awareness of it, especially when it comes to how AI works or doesn't work for patients of color, for example. But I think that the challenge is that there isn't necessarily all of that awareness for, okay, well, how does it work for patients who identify as women? Or how does it work for patients who are disabled or living with a chronic illness? Some of that can be helped by greater transparency. Right now, very oftentimes, people use training data and it's proprietary. They don't share it. Part of the whole advantage, if you have a really great data set, is if you keep it secret, you can use it to train your AI. Nobody else can. And so thinking through, okay, how do we do data nutrition labels so that people can understand, for example, oh, this algorithm was trained on white English women. So maybe it's not going to do really well on my patient population, which is mostly Hispanic women or Asian women. But I do think that transparency only gets you so far. And so I think there does need to be greater thought to, okay, do we say like you can only really bring your algorithm to market if you can demonstrate that it works well on patients across the spectrum? saying you can't pick and choose and you can't say, okay, well, my algorithm really succeeds with this very specific population, but not anybody else. That's a, a great point that you bring algorithms to market if they can justify that it works with uh, many populations. Right now, we are obviously in the uh, executive order. It talks about the foundation models and the challenges uh, with that, but this has not been uh, looked at. Do you think open source helps in this uh, uh, area, Karma? I think it does, but how much exactly can be really challenging. So I think about this oftentimes in the context of who's the consumer? Who's the person buying the algorithm? And if the entity buying the algorithm, say, is a hospital system, there are hospital systems that are really, really well resourced out there. Like I sit in Boston and Mass General Brigham is amazing. It's a behemoth. It's affiliated with Harvard. It has a ton of Harvard professors of bioinformatics floating around. So like it really can take any information and find somebody who can understand it. But then I also work with a lot of community health centers. And, you know, they have a IT person in the sense that like that person keeps like the email servers going. But they don't have the resources to really understand and unpack the AI products that they're being sold. And so I think the challenge is, how do you make it clear to the under-resourced systems, okay, here's what, here's the product so that they can make an informed decision about whether it works for their patients. But how can you also make sure that the products being sold work for those organizations as well? Because, you know, one bad outcome, I think, would be if essentially the mass general programs of the world 
got to use all of these algorithms to make their operations run more smoothly, improve their care. And the smaller community health centers, rural hospital systems got shut out of the AI revolution because they just didn't have the capacity to evaluate those products. Yeah. You know, uh, mass general community hospitals, that's a tough, I mean, there's a big uh, difference here. Um, Carmel, do you think, uh, uh, and maybe it is already there, and I'm not sure that today the physicians who are being trained or nurses or medical assistants, they should be trained on AI as uh, one of the core things that they are learning? Yeah, I mean, I think we are in the midst of a real shift with the medical professions. And I think about it a lot like airline pilots. So, you know, Amelia Earhart was doing basically everything by hand. And today's modern pilots don't. They're basically consumers of very sophisticated software and they direct the whole apparatus, but I'm not sure that they could fly Amelia Earhart's airplane because they're so used to using these technological aids. And that doesn't make them worse pilots. In fact, it can really extend and improve what they can do, but it makes them different pilots. And I think that we're in the midst of a shift in the medical profession that's very similar, where you have whole generations of physicians who did not grow up using AI decision-making software to read scans or to determine, okay, what's the right antibiotic? And that generation, I think, feels really comfortable pushing back against any AI recommendations. But you have this new generation of providers growing up, not knowing anything, but practicing with AI as a sidekick or a counterpart. And so their relationship and engagement with algorithms may look very different. And I think that we really need to think thoughtfully about what is the optimal person AI interaction and how do we train our physicians, but also our nurses and the rest of our healthcare workforce to interact with AI. So for example, nurses, a lot of them, you know, their license does not include medical decision-making, setting aside nurse practitioners and other advanced nurses. But I think we would all feel really uncomfortable with AI directing a certain kind of patient care. And, you know, one of those nurses of 25 years who's seen it all saying like, nope, being a person who's had all of these years of experience sitting in this room with this patient, I can tell you that is not the right decision. And how do we how do we accommodate that? And how do we respect the fact that the nurse isn't technically licensed to make decision making? The AI is, but she's got all of these years of experience. And at least to date, I think we still value that human judgment component. So. Sure. If I can uh, understand what you're saying, there's a generational divide also, besides everything else. Uh, you know, the older generation <laughs> uh, is probably resistant, and maybe rightly so, but the younger generation has grown up on digital medicine in some ways, and they're very comfortable with, as you said, a sidekick, co-pilot, whatever you want to call it. That's going to be an interesting uh, transition. Uh, for us to look at as a society, because that's happening as we speak, right, Karma? Yeah, it's happening as we speak. And I think there have been calls from people to really rethink medical education and start preparing for, there was somebody on the Microsoft AI team who was also a physician who wrote about needing to train for like physicians 2.0. And I think that's, Really true. I think medical schools need to really think about what's going to be facing their graduates in the coming years and offer coursework and curriculum that reflects the fact that they are going to practice in a very digitally heavy landscape. And why not? 
uh, they got used to electronic medical records. They can get used to this too. You had to give them some incentives for doing that. But, uh, you know, shifting to patient privacy and data security, how uh, do you think can regulatory frameworks, you know, balance them? We want the innovation in AI, but we want to protect uh, patient privacy. How, how can we create that kind of a regulatory framework, Karma? Yeah, I think it, I think it can be a challenge to balance patient interest in their data with AI, which needs a lot of kind of compiled data to really train itself. And I think that in the U.S., I think we're really right for reevaluating the way we do data privacy. You know, HIPAA famously, it's from 1996. Like 1996, our giant desktop computers could barely do anything. And it took like a good five minutes to dial up to the internet. Like you would click on a page and then you would like walk away and let it load. And then it was updated by high tech. But like high tech came out, when high tech came out, I had this friend in law school who I met and knew as the person who has an iPhone because she was the only person I knew with an iPhone. So it really still predates that digital apps revolution. And I think looking at the example of the GDPR, which is much more all-encompassing than HIPAA is. It's not meant to be just for medical data, although it does give heightened protection for medical data to say there's so much more health information out there outside of the electronic health records. Should we be protecting that? I think discussing a right to be forgotten, which, you know, I don't know necessarily how many people actually use the right to be forgotten, but I think that it does help allay patient concerns to say, ultimately, I do have control over my data. And so... Could the U.S. revisit its data governance regulations? I think that it would be time well spent. Yeah. So what you're saying is we really need to take another look at uh, HIPAA. Um, what do you think? Uh, some people say that there should be industry self-regulation uh, versus government intervention and in shaping AI policies in healthcare. Do you think government should be intervening or should we leave it to good folks like you? Well, I am a regulatory lawyer, so I love a good regulation. Like, I will never not go for regulations. Perhaps I'm a classic oldest child in that regard. I mean, I think that industry self-regulation is great. And I've met a lot of really wonderful, considerate, smart people who work in medical AI because they genuinely want to make healthcare better and stronger. I don't think that industry self-regulation and government regulation is an either or. And I think to say, okay, for the people who are really good eggs, let's even the playing field so that there's regulation so that the bad eggs don't just do what they want. So what you're saying is there's a medium uh, where we reward the good eggs and watch carefully over the maybe the not so good eggs also. Um, you know, Carmel, uh, AI is changing so rapidly right in front of your eyes. You know, we've had LLMs, large language models, then we've had now uh, multimodal systems. Then we have agents, super agents. Now there's talk of AGI. How do, do regulators stay updated and responsive to uh, not just AI, but the uh, technological advancements in AI and healthcare. I mean, healthcare is changing so rapidly. Uh, uh, you know, in, in Washington, we don't do quick. Uh, we don't do fast. So, but that's the challenge. I mean, how, how, how do we keep pace here? Yeah, I think it's really hard in a rapidly evolving area of growth. And 
it's truly amazing what LLMs like ChatGPT can do. I think the perhaps the best way to go about it is, and maybe I'm biased because I work at a university and I'm an academic, but like academics are always writing about what's new and exciting, right? Like, because that's how you get published. And so I think keeping close ties and like really looking at like, okay, when there's conferences on medical AI or conferences on the regulation of medical AI, what are people talking about? I think is a really good way to say, okay, what do we need to keep our eye on? So follow conferences, thought leaders, and things of that nature is what you're saying. Um, you said uh, that you are a regulatory lawyer. So are there any specific legal or ethical dilemmas that arise when you use AI to analyze sensitive health data? And can they be addressed through legislation? Yeah, so I think that there's certainly the privacy implications. I think one area where people struggle at times is ownership over data and therefore over AI. I think there's the sense, especially among patients who maybe have a rare disease, where they feel like my data is valuable and it's being commercialized and monetized by people who aggregate databases and then use those databases to train AI, but I'm not receiving any of the benefits. And I think this has been a discussion among patient groups. Okay, how do we use our data to benefit our communities as opposed to benefit outside actors? And so that has been an interesting area of development. So are you talking about, and to me, this would be something uh, interesting. It's like the newspapers are saying, hey, you can't crawl our data unless you, you know, pay us or we're, they're trying to monetize there. Are you saying that patient groups want to monetize patient data for uh, these LLMs to crawl uh, or to access their data? Is that what the thing is going on? Yeah, so I think some patient groups are thinking not necessarily, oh, we want to profit off this data, but are saying, okay, well, you're building a date you're building an algorithm made to govern, to use a random example, cystic fibrosis. I don't know if this is actually a discussion in the cystic fibrosis community. You're using a data set of, cyst of patients living with cystic fibrosis. You're building this algorithm that you're then selling to maybe hospitals or physician groups about how to best manage us. But we're not receiving any sort of discount on this treatment. We're still paying full freight. And so it becomes an issue of like, okay, well, if you're building this using our information, then it's, shouldn't we see some sort of benefit? Not necessarily a check in the mailbox, but making things a little bit cheaper, a little bit easier to access. That's a very interesting uh, point. Very, very interesting point for patient rights and patient data. Um, Carmel, uh, this is again, a, something of big personal interest to me. Uh, we have a mental health crisis in this country, maybe around the world. Um, the Surgeon General said loneliness is a huge, uh, crisis in this country. What are your thoughts in terms of the use of AI for mental health? There are now a lot of companies that are doing it. There's a, uh, uh, I think there's a chat box or something that's now got 20 million downloads, et cetera. From a regulator's perspective, since you pointed yourself out, uh, because we don't have enough uh, mental health professionals and there are such bizarre laws also in some ways to access uh, mental health pro uh, professionals sometimes. Can AI help in something like this? Yeah, so 
One example that comes to mind, it might not be exactly what we're talking about, but there's now all of these AI programs that will help write messages in response to patients. And especially now where patients often get their test results before the physician can reach out to them. Like the patient might see the test result and immediately send a message to their physician and be like, what does this mean? Should I be concerned, et cetera? And these programs can draft the message back and then the physician reads it over and agrees with it and sends it off or changes it. And some physicians were saying, actually, like I learned a lot from this AI program because it often started things with like a lot more niceties than I would have thought to like, oh, thank you for reaching out. Like, it's really wonderful that you're sharing your thoughts, et cetera. And that kind of language that might not have necessarily occurred to a human being was really helpful at making the patients feel better. And so it's not that, so it is possible that, you know, AI can really help people feel more connected and feel more heard. Certainly, and here perhaps I'll embarrass my husband, we have a large dog who needs a lot of walking. And so my husband sometimes late at night will just like chat with chat GPT because it's 11 p.m. There's nobody to call and he'll feel like, okay, I've like learned something. I've had a conversation. So I think that there's real ability to help the mental health epidemic and help people feel less lonely. I think, though, it's not sufficient just to say, okay, well, you have access to chat GPT or like the nicest, most empathetic version of chat GPT. And isn't that enough? I think there needs to be additional follow-up. I think people need to feel like, okay, I'm not just being pawned off on some AI chatbot but there's a bigger framework and I can access face-to-face -face people if I need to. I can access additional mental health services if I need to. But you see, what you're saying is the possibilities are there because that's, as you said, we have a mental health epidemic. Um, uh, Carmel, um, finally, as I said, uh, our audience in many cases is uh, policymakers and uh, stakeholders, you know, who are, uh, uh, navigating, you know, the the complex landscape of AI regulation, you know, in healthcare specifically, for the first time, what advice uh, would you give to uh, them who are listening out there? Your final words and words of wisdom to them. Oh my gosh, words of wisdom. Um, you know, I think that AI presents some. Um, novel, some novel issues, but I think taking a step back and trying to think through the common sense solutions is always sort of the right idea. That is to say, we have regulated really complex products and complex industries before and thinking through, okay, what worked, what didn't work. For example, learning from medicine that handoffs are always going to be a weak point. Okay, how can we minimize handoffs as we regulate AI might be a good approach. Well, as you said, we've dealt with complex things before, uh, get things done, look at how you can fix handoffs. A uh, lot to learn uh, from you and from this conversation, Carmel. So much uh, of value here. Thank you so much for taking the time and spending it with our audience and with us, it was really, really, very, very helpful. It was lovely to talk to you about these important issues. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Regulating AI Innovate Responsibly podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to any resources mentioned on the show. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe so you'll never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review.